Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just going to make sure that everyone is muted um, as well as your uh, camera is turned off. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I definitely appreciate you folks here. Uh, my name is Brian Fan. If you're not, you know, if you're not from the area or if not part of uh, our ACS, has never been part of it, um, I'm the president of American Cetacean Society. Um, so in just a little bit, I'll start. As I continue to let more and more people in, I'm going to stop my share. Okay, so since it is seven o'clock, um, give me a second as I get. <laughs> give me one second, everyone. Show your picture or not? Because a lot of people don't are not doing audio. That's fine. Milos, Joe Eustace, Kyle. Hmm. Milos Radekovic. <laughs> okay, give me one second, everyone. For some reason, my... Here we go. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Brian Fan. Like I said before, um, I am the president of American Cetacean Society here in Monterey Bay, um, and I am glad and happy that I get to host these every single month. So, if you folks are here with us this this month, we have the pleasure to have Larry Foster as our speaker this month. So, thank you so much, Larry, for joining us. Um, I like to do a little housekeeping. Uh, so. If you folks have any questions at all, feel free to throw it into the chat function. Some of you folks have already kind of figured it out. Uh, Uko definitely says, hey, uh, everyone should get Larry's book. Hi from uh, Washington. <laughs> um, and a lot of people say yes, yes to that. Um, I have his book right here. So just a heads up, definitely you should, you folks should think about getting his book. So it's a great book. I, it's right next to my bed, uh, my my bed and I like to read it from time to time. So thank you everyone for joining us. Like I said, um, here in the Monterey Bay, we're very lucky with whales. We get them about every, we're pretty much close to every single day of the year. Right now, I like to update uh, everyone what's happening. We've been having lots of humpback whales coming into the bay. Lots of interesting moms and calves, uh, pairs that have been sighted in the bay in the last month. Uh, a lot of you folks who have been know up to date with our local news we have still been seeing fluke skywalker the calf of the year as well as his mom aurora um, and then something that's been quite exciting for us we have been seeing two different individual killer whales orca transient uh, transient ecotypes that have been hanging out here in the monterey bay close to every single day so um Definitely, if you folks are here in the Monterey Bay, get out on a boat, go try to see some amazing humpback whales uh, and possibly see some orca or even other wildlife. You, of course, you have chances of blue whales, fin whales, and then dolphins as well. So been quite amazing when it comes to wildlife here in the Monterey Bay. Another thing for everyone to know um, for our meeting tonight, uh, definitely, definitely, if you feel like you want to donate, uh, if you want to donate for to American Cetacean Society, your donations mean a lot to us. Your donations actually help us give grants to our local students that we have here in the Monterey Bay. We were able to just give out a grant uh, to a student at University of California, uh, Santa Cruz. Her, her research is looking at diet analysis, you know, uh, in the last month or so based off of looking at fatty, fatty acids um, in their tissues. So it's something that we're really happy that we were able to give out those grants. So if you folks want to donate at all and you like what we do, just, you know, put in a little bit of, you know, what money into our uh, donation bin, which is on our website. So which is on uh, acsmb.org. Um, I will throw it into the chat, that link, if you want to donate. Anything that you do definitely helps us out. Like I said, it's for our grants that we give out to our local students, our masters and our PhD students. 
So I'm going to now introduce our speaker. So the art of discovering whales. Larry Foster is the first scientific artist to commit his entire 50 plus year career to producing atomically correct portrayals of cetacea, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. His goal is to debunk centuries old myths that incorrectly presented whales as grotesque, blimp-like, and dangerous animals, and to accurately depict whales, dolphins, and porpoises as the graceful, sleek, and streamlined marine mammals they really are. Before Larry's pioneering atomically correct whale depictions, guesswork by whale artists had always prevailed. Larry played a key role in differentiating whales from the whaling that has educated millions through art mediums, including life-size sculptures. Larry's pioneering images have been seen in National Geographic, Sismonian, BBC Wildlife, and scores of other publications, as well as the best-selling The Sierra Club Handbook of Whales and Dolphins. In his recent memoir, The Art of Discovering Whales, Larry describes his journey devoting decades of countless hours of research and studies showing whale lovers everywhere the true body shape of whales. Uh, read more about Larry Foster at whalesonlypress.com. And whale Larry is definitely happy to be here today um, to help out and present with us at American Cetacean Society. So without any further ado, Larry Foster, folks. That's you. So, you can, so yeah, you can start, uh, you can start sharing your screen. Okay. So. Hold on, hold on. Oh, that's the wrong slide. <laughs> Let's see. Sorry, I want to start at the beginning. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. <clears throat> okay. 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 <laughs> Sorry about that. Brian, thank you so much. We're, uh, we're very happy to be here. We being Mary Foster. Um, <laughs> so cute. Our little dog, Jack Foster, and myself. We have gathered uh, a collection of slides, about 45 minutes worth, I would say. And we have two captions that I would like to read. Now, I want to read one caption right now. This one. Whale terror at sea, 14th century Flemish woodcut. LF felt pen. Now, I like that caption because I like the combination of 14th century felt pen. For some reason, that amused me. The point is, I'm trying to show that whales had never been treated very well in history, put it mildly. That gray whale in the upper left, that's been in several books. It looks like it's overinflated, about 17,000 PSI, I would guess, just from looking at this. The humpback at the bottom is also overinflated and uh, it's got an eyebrow giving it an attitude. The drawings at the right, you know, none of these artists ever saw a whale, just like myself. <laughs> I've never seen a whale either, not very many. But this is um, typical of the artwork that existed as I was growing up um, as a little kid. Here's another one, another page of some artists. The guy in the upper left, the woman, the person, in the upper left paints very good clouds and that person paints water better than I do. But what about that whale? Where is this person getting the information on whale anatomy? I wanted to see anatomically, anatomically correct whales. We call this the blimp whale. Down below, here's an example of some artwork. Creativity in artwork, not research. Life Magazine, 1945. They, uh, the artist put a lump on the lower lip right in front of the eye, a little protuberance, a big protuberance. That was an error made up, somebody got creative. To the right, I showed examples of why I immediately in the 60s gave up on other artists. These artists all perpetuated that same error. It's sort of strange to look at it. Now, if you look at the real blue whale, you see some beautiful things, long, Streamlined, 
streamlined, fast, sleek, beautiful, looks like a Corvette. Uh, it's the biggest and one of the nicest Rorquals, Rorquals, R-O-R-Q-U-A-L, A-L. Those are the long streamlined wheels that have pleats on their throats. You can see some of the pleats in this, uh, in this uh, photograph right here. Um, we, uh, we, we saw this animal pulled out of the water a little more on the, on the daily, the wheeling deck. Uh, this photograph, I think it was by Frederick True and published in 1904. So this information has, has been around. I saw the whales as being long and thin. And so I got, a, I got rid of the bulbous idea of whales and tried to paint them long and thin, just as I did with this blue whale. Now, Mary suggested to me about 30 or 35 years ago, Larry, we have binders of your paintings and drawings all over. Why don't we put together a nice big catalog or some kind of a book or something? So we talked, to, talked about it for 30 years or so, and then about four or five years, and we got serious about it, and here's the book. Now, I was talking to um, the, the national uh, ACS president, President Uko Gorter, and he said, Larry, I noticed in your book you're using um, our ACS logo. And I said, yes, I like that logo a lot. I guess I'm sort of self-centered because uh, I like it because I designed it. And he here's how that happened. Patty Warhol and I were very good friends back in the 80s. She was ACS president at that time. And ACS had this logo in the upper left, as you can see, the American Cetacean Society. Mary, can you blow that logo up there? Yeah, yeah. So that shows the whale. Now, this is a Tooney Town Humpy Dumpy type of whale flukes, not very anatomically, anatomically correct. So I said to Patty, why don't we do a better, more anatomically correct uh, logo? Because whale conservation is not Tooney Town Humpy Dumpy fun time. It's uh, more serious. She agreed, and there's the logo in the upper right, and we all like it. These other, these other visuals here are examples of some of the work I did for ACS over the years. I love ACS, obviously. Here's the second caption I wanna read on this drawing here by myself. I was about five years old, it was Cran in Sacramento, California. Um, I think the date was 1939, but here's the caption. The principal, said it was the finest, most praiseworthy example of marine mammal artwork he had ever seen in the history of the kindergarten at Newton Booth Elementary School. <laughs> now I had a good time writing that caption. We really did see a whale when I was a little tyke, little boy. A whale came to the train station in Sacramento and I think around 1940, Little kids got a balloon, so you know it's before the war. Uh, uh, and we all looked at the whale, my cousins, my relatives, my uncles, everybody, friends and people, neighbors, and we didn't see a whale. We saw a big black wall that didn't make a bit of sense. The eye was on top. We didn't know what that was. There's a flipper. We didn't know what that was. Uh, and it sort of left me cold and empty on whales. I was in the 60s, I was repairing and I was designing and building stained glass lampshades. I, uh, I got a kick out of making those lampshades. And I said, I think I'll make a lamp lampshade in the shape of a blue whale. That would be nice. I'll make it nine feet long, plenty of light. So I took this drawing. I didn't do any research. I went to Scientific American, grabbed this uh, drawing here and blew it up nine feet and started my whale. However, halfway through it, I realized, uh oh, somebody made some goofy because this is nothing like a blue whale. I, di I didn't realize that it's too much glass and not enough blue whale. Here's a, here's a sperm whale calf that I did. This, uh, this shot is looking into the mouth of a sperm whale calf. It's life size. Once again, too much glass, not enough whale. It's on display at Potpourri Gallery in Berkeley, California. And life size is 12 feet long. But anatomically, ooh, very embarrassing. So I had to go back to the drawing board and go to the library and get real serious about it. UC uh, Berkeley Library, uh, the best on the West Coast or close to it. And uh, we had a chance to look at uh, photographs of whales and whaling. Now it's mostly whaling, I'll tell you that right now. 
it's a little bit like you want to take the kids to a field trip to the forest, but there is no forest. So you take them to the lumber yard. I'm just kidding about that. But anyway, at the bottom left, I'm measuring uh, things off carcasses. That's how I got to know the whales. The drawing on top is a pencil drawing. It's five feet long. It shows the relationship um, of the whales uh, to, the, to the, the, the people. It's a blue whale. One more thing. I mentioned the pleats on the throat. Look at these pleats. This whale can take a bite of seawater larger than your guest bedroom. I wanted to show that to people in general to show the beauty of the whale, even though it was a dead whale. These are all going to be dead whales, a few of them here. The little girl is standing on the rostrum, the top of the mouth of a northern right whale. I call this the right family. Behind the little girl's legs, you can see the baleen. Here's my first humpback drawing, uh, also a carcass, uh, and the, once again, a pencil drawing. I use pencil because it's the most austere, sincere, uh, no fooling around medium there is. Uh, graphite and the surface. It's a, it's a beautiful, serious way to get uh, on top of the subject that you're trying to uh, identify. Here's another pencil drawing on top. It shows how little I knew uh, in the beginning about right whale anatomy, uh, not at all close. But I got the nerve to try and um, put all these photographs together and do a fin whale. Fin whale is a very beautiful, very beautiful auroracle, long, thin, streamlined pleats on the, on the throat, on the chest. This painting, this drawing, uh, is I think six feet long. It's now in Randy Puckett's home. Randy Puckett's a famous uh, sculptor, bronze sculptor of whales, and no one has done as good as he has. Humpback whales mostly. Gordon Williamson is a, was an outstanding marine biologist. He loved eels, but he also loved whales, and he persuaded a Japanese whaling company to shoot their whales with non-exploding harpoons so that he might jump into the water with this 35 millimeter underwater camera and photograph these poor doomed whales while they're still alive to try and show their true body shapes underwater. I saw his article in Scientific Reports, the Whales Research Institute in Tokyo, Japan, and I sent him a couple of my renderings of carcasses to tell him how impressed I was with his, uh, his article doing that strange event where he jumped in the water and photographed the dying whale. Uh, he called me up. We became good friends over the phone. He sent me all of his photographs that he took underwater. And I had enough minky whale photographs to become minky whale relevant. I did this study on the left. The top three are northern minky whales. You can tell that by that white flipper. And the bottom two are, are variations. Uh, southern southern hemisphere variations, mostly in pigmentation. They might be different species. I don't, I don't think so. Maybe. But um, I sent a nice print of these uh, five figures to Gordon, and he mailed them all over the, the northern hemisphere. All of a sudden, I had a hidden record. They were first published in Sea Frontiers in Florida, and then the Wales Research Institute in Tokyo, Japan, and then a whole bunch of other places. This is a blue whale. Try to show a blue whale, make it long and thin. A little too long and thin. This drawing was unfin unfinished at the time, but it does show a very beautiful uh, blue whale flipper. It's a very, uh, very, a very nice flipper for a, for a whale. Nothing else has a flipper like that. Now, I my first my first sculpture proposal back in the 60s was the whale's flukes. I always thought a whale sculpture of flukes would be very nice. And I put the flukes on this brochure that uh, we did for the American Cetacean Society. Chevron helped us pay for it. And we sent this to anybody that wanted to hear about gray whales uh, in, the, in the United States and anywhere else. We did, um, we did uh, this very fine uh, brochure to tell people, I'm trying to see what, uh, what uh, we had here. Yeah, yeah, the brochure, and then, and then, and then I, yeah, I know, I came up with the idea. I would like to do a life-size whale sculpture, but it has to be anatomically accurate. 
It has to be physically, you know, morphology correct. Otherwise, why do it? So I did this drawing to show what a life size sculpture might be. I sent this drawing to Ted Walker. Ted Walker wrote this book in the upper right hand corner. Um, and there's enough information in that little booklet. He studied gray whales in, in Baja, California for many years. I, I sent this copy of my, this drawing to Ted Walker and he called me up. This is Larry, this, this is Ted Walker speaking. I'd like to talk to whale man, Larry Foster. Well, we talked, he invited me to come and see him uh, in uh, La Jolla, California. I went, we spent the whole night talking about gray whales and showing slides. I invited, invited him to come to my studio. He did, and he brought me three carousels of gray whale, uh, gray whale swimming in Baja, California, and a bunch of other stuff. We became very good friends. Uh, we had tuna sandwiches and I uh, poured him a nice glass of ice water. Now, he made me gray whale relevant. He brought the slides to my studio and I went all through them. He gave me enough information to actually build a life-size ferro cement gray whale sculpture. And here it is. In the middle is the armature right in the middle of being uh, put together with many rods. On the left, I'm uh, on top of the whale. My right foot is on the whale's left flipper. And even at this point, you can still see the, um, you can see the, the phalanges. The right photograph is Valerie Cross, ace researcher, Jack Sims, very important whale guy and a really good friend, and myself. And we're getting the whale's tail ready for the, uh, the, the, the mortar or cement. That is Jack Sims kneeling in the middle talking to friendly neighbors. The whale's name was Sandy because the place got so sandy that you couldn't name it anything else but Sandy. The bottom photograph is a quick shot to show uh, how much kids loved it. The first appearance of the whale when it came out of the warehouse was at Caltech Pasadena. And it seemed perfectly logical to all the people there, I believe, to have a gray whale right in the middle of the campus. And somebody said, well, why would you want a dead whale in the middle of the campus? Well, Ted Walker assures me that a gray whale, if it gets hung up, I don't use the word strand in this case, they fool around in shallow water all the time. If they get hung up in shallow water, they can wait for the next tide. I said, well, that is exactly what Sandy is doing. Sandy is waiting for the next tide. Her eyes are closed, proving that she's actually alive. This whale is made in sections and it traveled all over the United States. Here it is in Fremont, California. Every time I made an appearance, we send out a brochure or flyer or some kind of information you know, to uh, schools and marine mammal centers and museums, anyone that would like to talk about uh, a gray whale. Now those ducks, this is in Fremont, California, not far from Oakland, where the whale was, was constructed. The ducks are very friendly. I got to know them very well. And on the left-hand side, that's my beautiful little Porsche. I drove it all over the country. Here the whale is in Philadelphia at the Franklin Institute. And if you're ever in Philadelphia, you want to go to the Franklin Institute. The director said, you know, Larry, since your whale has been here, we think about a million people have climbed on it. I said, whoa, we must be doing something right. He said, yes, we must be. The visuals at the bottom are posters that we would send out when the whale would make appearances. I was developing a large show, 70, 60, 70 paintings and drawings and sculptures. The lower right was a, my biggest show, it came in two trucks. Uh, it's the, at Boston's Museum of Science. That was a great show. And when the whale traveled around, then it came back home, it ended up in Pacific Grove in front of my favorite museum, the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. I want to say something about this beautiful mu museum. Vern Yaden, Dr. Vern Yaden was the director in the late 60s. I wrote him a letter and asked him if I could come and talk to him about whales in Monterey Bay and elsewhere. He invited me, we became good friends. We talked about doing a life-size whale sculpture. Uh, and finally we did bring the whale to um, the museum. Vern retired. And I had a good friend working at the Smithsonian in Washington, Washington, D.C. His name was Paul Finnegan. 
Paul got the idea he would like to move to California. He also got the idea that he would like to be the director of a museum. So when my good friend Vern Yaden retired, my good friend Paul Finnegan took over. How sweet is that? Now, how did the whale become the property of the museum? Here's how that happened. My father called me up, said, Larry, I just bought three pounds of your whale, <laughs> your whale in Pacific Grove. I said, you did? He said, yeah, they're selling it by the pound. And so I bought three pounds, I had it framed and I show my certificate. I had my, they sent me a certificate and I had it framed, I show that certificate to everyone. And some belt, lapel buttons and stickers and things. Now, how did this happen? How did they work a campaign together to actually raise the thousands of dollars to, to buy this whale? Well, um, there's uh, three extremely bright, loving, wonderful people that made the cement whale happen. Milos Radakovic, David, Schoen, David Schoenman, and, and Randy Puckett. Rennie Puckett uh, is well known for his bronze sculptures. He's about the best in the world at that. He does mostly hump X. I am, um, I wanted to uh, see what is coming next. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to mention Elena, <clears throat> Elena Azevedo too, because Elena Azevedo is a friend of the museum. She loves the cement whale and she's a writer well known in, in, in Pacific Grove. She's the one that talked to Mary and I, we, we're good friends, and she said, let's do a book, either on the whale or on Larry or something. So she's the one that got us started on our book. So we can thank Elaine as the video right here. Thank you. Let's go back a little bit to the National Whale Symposium in Bloomington, Indiana. Had a major show there. Bill Kurtzinger is the best underwater photographer of all time, in my, in my belief. He had at least six covers on the National Geographic. He took some of my drawings into the art director, the National Geographic. And he said, you know, this guy, Larry Foster, he's having a major show at the National Whale Symposium in Bloom Bloomington, Indiana in November. And we can go, we can go meet him and talk. So they did, and we had a great time. People from the National Geographic, they wanted me to do a chart for the magazine showing my, um, New ideas of what whales uh, surely must look like. And here's that, here's that chart. They loved it. I uh, would do it differently now. I think I had too much fear of making the whales overweight. Uh, the, that gray whale is uh, way too thin and the humpback is not very robust either. However, they liked it and they printed um, 12 million of these. So all of a sudden I had, I had another hit and record. I had my own chart eight and a half by 11. I sent this to schools along with a little education packet that I would send out. At the lower right, it says, okay to reproduce this little eight and a half by 11. But it's one of the better whale charts in those days because uh, it showed the animals with uh, some sincerity. And this person has all, uh, obviously studied whales. Uh, this is part of a large wall display I had of line drawings of each and every species. I want to show what the whole group of cetacean looked like. And here it is. These drawings are not pen and ink. Uh, they're not paint. They're not pencil. They're chart tape, one eighth inch chart tape. Chart tape makes very consistent line work and it's easy to change. The scale of this group, this presentation, is one inch equals a foot. So a 90 foot blue whale at the bottom means a 90 foot tape drawing of a blue whale. Obviously, this was quite a spread on the wall. wall. Uh, I did uh, some uh, dolphins for the National Geographic. And, 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 and what's that, Mary? Oh, that's good. Go ahead. Um, Mary, yeah, thank you, Mary. This is the one I wanted to show. This is uh, the one, the, one of the things I did for the National Ge Geographic, specializing in dolphins. The killer whale is a big dolphin. I showed my amateurish ability by um, making the background too dark. Uh, it's too bad I did that, but um, we still want to get whales in high places, and, that, and that's what we did. Here's the one, thank you, Mary. This is, uh, this is a good one uh, for um, Patty Warhol called me up, a Pacific financial company just wanted to do an insurance company, you know, power of the Pacific. They want to do a whale chart 
Patty called me and said, call them right now. I, re I mentioned your name and uh, they would like you to do their whale chart. I called them and I suggested a chart showing just the baleen whales. And here they are. If, on the right, they, they printed I think about 14,000 of these. They sent me a thousand. Um, on the, the lower right is the actual artwork. It's a transparent watercolor on a 30 by 40 illustration board. Here's a little number that Mary and I did for uh, Noah. Mary did the graphics at the bottom, putting all those mechanics together. I did the paintings of the animals. That was my first sea turtle, I love those sea turtles. Noah wanted to make it possible for anyone that sees a, sees a stranded animal on the coast in California to report it. That's the whole idea of this, of this chart. BBC from across the pond called me up. They want to do, uh, for the wildlife magazine, they want to do a chart of all the whales that swim around the various isles. Um, so we did that. And then we went on to some other uh, charts. Here's the last one I did for the Na National Geographic just before they changed art directors. Now these whales are getting a little better. That humpback is a pretty nice humpback whale. And, uh, well, I just mentioned one thing. Mentioned one thing at the left. That's the first and last time I ever had to paint hair. I mean, you know, fur. But Mary and I got a taste of paleontology. We we're talking about the evolution of whales. National Geographic wanted me to do a page showing the the position of the nose to the blowhole over millions of years. On top, there's a blowhole the nose in front and then you can see the migration of the blowhole to the top of the head the bottom is not a fossil that's a, a modern a bottomless dolphin this little chart on the left i took this to the national geographic they already knew all this and i know it too um but it's typical to show a terrestrial animal when you're talking about the evolution of whales a terrestrial animal and then a intermediate animal i'll call it intermediate uh, with four legs and a paddle shaped tail like a beaver that goes up and down. Then a Dorodontine, no more hind legs at that point, and flip and flukes and flippers. Flippers may have joints in them at that point, and enough teeth for a pride of lions. Below is a squalodon. Uh, in niche, they sort of uh, preceded the bottlenose dolphin or modern dolphins. They live, uh, they live for millions of years. The bottom is a bottlenose dolphin. So the National Geographic sent Mary and I down to LA County Museum in Los Angeles to do some work with my very good friend, Dr. Lawrence Barnes. He is a master of whale paleontology, fossil whales. And we spent several days on several occasions talking to him about the animals. And as we went over it with guesswork, I would do a ballpoint pen drawing to try and you know show uh, what uh, animals might might look like based on the evidence from the fossils. Uh, you can determine quite a bit from the fossils. Now, modern drawings would be better drawings done the day. You know why? Because it'd be based on more modern, more contemporary guesswork. Here's some books I was pleased to be in. The Sierra Club Handbook of, Dol of Whales and Dolphins in the middle. They, uh, I think they reprinted that about 20 times. It was around forever. So all of a sudden I had another hit in record. Now Mary, I did about 80 paintings for this book. Mary, Mary put together a little collage or a, a, a sampling of the paintings. I think I worked on it for about four years, maybe five years. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and these paintings are in tempera, which is some people call it gouache. It's very expensive, um, uh, highly refined, poster paint. It dries matte, water soluble. It doesn't cure, it just dries like poster paint. The beauty of that is there will never be for the photographer any shine, any glare, or any reflection. Even my pencil drawings suffered at the hands of photographers. They usually didn't know what they were photographing. And graphite has a tendency to shine a little bit, glare. So I was happy to get into tempera. Now, my favorite whale, my favorite rorqual, long, thin uh, plates on the, on the chest, is the fin whale. 
The fin wheel has the most striking example of pigmentation asymmetry in the animal kingdom, if I can say so. The left side of the face is dark gray or black. The right side, the right lip, is pure white. Now, Jack Sims saw this, my good friend and good whale worker. He said, Larry, we could do a 50-foot sculpture of a fin whale in one piece out of fiberglass. It probably wouldn't weigh too much more than a 1,000 pounds, and we could show that beautiful right lip. And I thought, wow, this is a beautiful idea. So Jack organized the whole crew. He found the place for Mason and San Francisco. They, they, uh, they donated the space to build the whale. He organized the crew. World Wildlife Fund, there's their panda in the middle. They helped us with quite a bit of money. That was a beautiful thing. We couldn't have done it without them. There is Jack Sims on the lower right, guiding the helicopter down to move the whale from the warehouse to the Marina Green in San Francisco. This event made national TV, and we were on for, I would say, um, three and a half, maybe four seconds. On the lower left, you can see the whale's beautiful lip and how much kids love the whale. Here's a, here's a photograph showing the whale's other lip, the left side. We had to measure this, but we didn't have a tape measure. So we measured it with kids. As it turns out, it takes about um, 12 kids to uh, measure a whale. This whale's name is Fina, Fina the fin whale. The, the Latin name is Balanoptra fecilis. So that's a little too long to be catchy. So I changed Fecilis to Fina. This is not an accurate measurement, you know, because kids vary quite a bit in length. Here's the whale, Fina the fin whale, at a permanent home. It's the Lawrence Hall of Science, part of UC Berkeley, up in the Berkeley Hills. I'm admiring the blowholes, it looks like. <laughs> I want to put whales in high places. I want to show a couple of the, my ideas for a whale tail sculpture. This is a painting on the right on a photograph. My two friends are standing there pretending to be looking at a whale's tail sculpture. In the lower left, that's a pen, you know, ballpoint pen drawing. Um, even if you didn't understand whale anatomy with whale anatomy with, with the flukes and the notch, the median notch, if you, if you didn't, didn't understand whale anatomy, to me, that would still be a beautiful sculpture just because of the intrinsic the intrinsic shapes, the forms. So we wanted to get whales in high places. I had many ideas on the topic. The Bureau of Engraving was getting to know me pretty well. When I first proposed what I wanted to propose, whales on US post stamps, postage was eight cents. I'm gonna take a little drink of seawater. Ooh, salty. So here's, here was my most convincing uh, array that I sent them. Postage by then was 25 cents. The Bureau of Engraving actually called me and they said, Mr. Foster, we're so pleased with your presentation. Your stamp designs are beautiful and we love them all. But I have to tell you, we have nothing to do with subject matter on post stamps. It's all done politically and therefore maybe a little uncertain and definitely circuitous. But we appreciate your enthusiasm and your zeal so much. We're gonna send you a little token of our appreciation. And two weeks later, I got a check for $2,000. So I had tears of happiness and tears of unhappiness. Didn't get whales in high places on the post stamps. However, did much better with the Bank of America. Bank of America was my bank. They were, in, they were headquartered in San Francisco. I was right across the bay in Alameda. They came by. They wanted me to, to design five whale checks for the bank. I said, well, I'll be happy to do that. So these are the designs. Each design, the length is, is 24 feet, 24 inches feet, what am I saying? Inches wide. And I did the drawings very subtle in, in tempera, so, or no, in this case, transparent watercolor. Once again, no glare. And I put a film positive, a 24 inch film positive on each illustration with registration marks showing exactly where I wanted the lines, the mandatory lines for the checks to go.
I didn't want any line going through a whale's eye or tangent to a whale's lip or anything else amateurish. And one little perk, whales in high places, the Bank of America loved the design so much that they put my name in the, in the lower right-hand corner of the checks. They said, Larry, we've never done this before, but your checks are so outstanding that we, uh, we gave the artist credit. So I thought that was pretty good. I immediately ordered nine boxes of checks. And every time I wrote a check, my name was on it three times. I thought that was pretty highly evolved. Now, there is one little perk, one big perk. The Bank of America gave the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Marine Mammal Fund thousands of dollars from the proceeds from my check designs. So I felt like I had a nice hand in, um, in raising a lot of money for these uh, great institutions. Whales in high places. How about whales playing poker? This is a nice painting commissioned by friends of mine, uh, friends of ours in uh, in Michigan. They they love cards and they love whales. We thought that might get whales in high places a little bit. Uh, didn't really too much. Certainly not as high as whales playing poker or even cats playing canasta. Dogs playing poker. I mean, yeah, dogs playing poker. What am I saying? Yeah, but I will mention at the bottom. There's a new species. That's uh, those are card sharks. <laughs> Whales in high places, how about on a coin? The photograph in the upper left was by, taken by outstanding cetological field person, Ken Balcom, good friend of mine. He took this photograph back in the early 70s or late 60s. No one knew what it was. I didn't. I said, Ken, now what are we looking at here? Is this a whale with a broken jaw or his mouth open or what? He explained it to me. I did the drawing in the middle, a pencil drawing. I added the other flipper, brought the whale out of the water a little more. And this painting, this drawing, was on display at a, a UNESCO conference in Paris. Some people from Tonga were there. They wanted to use the drawing on a coin, and they did. There's the coin in the lower right. So we thought, we thought that was very nice. People in Tonga love humpback whales, and uh, they, we definitely had whales in high places on this one. Now, they always, over and over, give me credit for the design of the coin. However, we give credit to Ken Balcom, because he started it all with this iconic photograph. I like the idea of uh, portraits of whales. If you do a, a portrait, you don't have to show the whole body. You can just show, just show the face. So if I was going to do a portrait of a blue whale, that could be on a 20-foot canvas. Fin whale on an 18-foot canvas, and so on. Portraits of whales. The painting on the right, a minke whale and calf, I actually did that painting. Oh, here it is here. It's about 10 feet. You can walk up to it, and you'll see exactly what size you are compared to a minke whale. The ladder on the right has been reinforced and modified, so don't have to worry about the ladder. Now, here's the last of our slides that are project-oriented. Trying to get whales in high places. That was the beginning from the, that was, that was the idea from the, from the very beginning. This is a whale museum. Fort Mason in San Francisco called for suggestions of how to use one of their warehouses they were going to turn over. I proposed a whale museum. And quite a nice museum it would have been, uh, whales in high places for sure. Now, Mary put together just quickly here some slides just showing the beauty of whales and uh, not necessarily project oriented. These are southern right whales. This is like a right whale singles bar. It's a very nice painting because it shows so many different views of right whales. They're uh, exquisite animals to put it mildly. Here's some more right whales a trio of right whales, southern right whales. Roger Payne studied right whales in, in Patagonia up close, eye to eye. He knows more about right whale anatomy than anyone else. And he criticized, crit, criticized and critiqued many, many, many of my right whale, my, my, my right whale uh, paintings and drawings. He made me right whale relevant just like Gordon did with the monkey whales. I did a bunch of dolphin paintings too, over and over, I love dolphins. This is one of my favorite dolphins, Fraser's dolphin. Shows them swimming away. 
they're quite streamlined and beautiful. And you can tell by those little flippers, those little pointed flippers, that, that suggests they must swim fast, and they do. They swim underwater about 15,000 miles an hour. No, I'm just kidding. Here's, a, here's some more dolphins. These are, these are snellas. It's a group of dolphins, six, seven, eight. I don't know how many snellas there are, but they're a beautiful little sweet-faced dolphin. This is an oil painting I did for Patty Warhol. It's now in, now in her house. Porpoises you, porpoises, you say. Here are six species of porpoise, these six species of porpoise. They don't look like dolphins. They don't act like dolphins. They're not at all like dolphins. The animal in the upper left, that's an oil painting of three vaquitas, uh, Phocina sinus. That is probably the most endangered cetacean on the planet. Certainly one of them. They only live around Baja, California, and fishermen's nests and other human activity are pretty well uh, threatening threatening almost uh, to extinction. There are several good groups working on that, and the best, finest, most powerful group, the American Cetacean Society, ACS. They have a nice movement to try and save the vaquita. I want to show a narwhal just for fun. You can see that long tusk. That's a tooth that grows out from the upper jaw. But I also wanted to show the coquettish little flippers that curl up. And in male narwhals, the flukes are no longer swept back, as shown here. The lower left shows narwhals swimming with belugas. They both live exclusively in the cir circumpolar seas of the northern hemisphere and nowhere else. Let's skip over to those beak whales. That's a big group of whales that are very mysterious and to me very, very intriguing. They have many unusual characteristics. For one thing, no or very reduced notch in the flukes. You can see that right there. Here's another one. Uh, this is um, Cuvier's beak whale. It doesn't look like any porpoise. It doesn't look like, doesn't look like any dolphin. It doesn't look like any other whale. They're unique animals, these beak whales. The, the ballpoint pen drawing at the bottom shows tails. There's a group in the group of beak whales called the Mazophodons. There's probably, uh, they're about the most mysterious of all. They're, they're, there's probably about 14 species. Now, I don't know how many there are, but they're very unique and weird animals, weird. Um, they have teeth, males have teeth that grow up uh, from the, the lower jaw above the beak. And they use these teeth to push and shove and scrape and convince other dolphins uh, who is the proper boss in the pecking order to establish hierarchy. Now, of these mozapodons, one of them has a very curious characteristic. These mandibular teeth grow up and over the rostrum to the point that it restricts the animal's ability to open its mouth. However, strap tooth whales eat mostly squid, and squid are perfectly suckable. So the teeth probably do not, in fact, do not interfere with dinner time. And I made one observation. When they push and shove and scrape each other, they do a lot of scraping and scratching. Um, they can do so without jeopardizing their lower jaw because they can close their mouth and uh, scrape away. Here's the, the largest Tooth whale, not beak whale. This is the largest tooth whale, Odonistes. This is um, this is sperm whales. I first did this painting. I was in Massachusetts at Wood Hole, Woods Hole, and they said to me, Larry, you know, sometimes sperm whales sleep vertical in the water, vertically in the water, in a vertical position. So I painted that. It didn't look right. It, it looked stupid. The whales were hanging up, some with their noses up, some with their noses down. No one liked the painting and I didn't either. So I did another painting, re relaxing sperm whales at the surface. And that's this painting. <laughs> that was sort of a fun painting. Um, Donna Grover wrote a book, The Blue Whale, part of the Young, Young Explorer series, series for the National Geographic. I had to leave room for text in this one, but it shows some nice killer whales, shows a good saddle patch. 
I wanted to show a close-up of a Rorqual's face. Rorqual, long, thin, pleats, uh, streamlined, swim fast. Here's that emotive stare looking right through you of a close-up of a Rorqual. In Marie Mammal talk, this is like Mona Lisa's smile. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, um, here's another one I did that wanted to show uh, the fact that gray whales don't resemble any other baleen whale. So I did this little painting to show, um, to show uh, the individual characteristic of this, of this baleen whale. One species and uh, one genus. Very nice whale, gray whales. We do love gray whale flukes. Here's a painting I did for Mary showing, uh, uh, showing humpback whale. This is humpback poetry in motion in the ocean. Mary named it. And it's sort of a fun, fun oil painting. It's a pretty good size oil painting. But I wanted to show anatomically correct paintings. So here is a, a one tube indigo paint, uh, monochromatic of, uh, of humpback, a humpback whale and calf. That's pretty nice and pretty realistic. Now here's our very last slide. No, no, almost our last slide. This is a breaching humpback whale. Why would anybody paint a breaching humpback whale when there are thousands of excellent photographs of that same event? Well, the artist can exaggerate and two things up a little bit. In my case, I exaggerated every little last misty speck of sea spray. And I used French Impressionist water. And I used a lot of contrast, pure white, pure black. I, um, I wanted to show something dramatic. Also, one little thing, I, uh, I could see the whale occurring before my very eyes, my very own landlocked eyes. That was the last time I was ever going to be, a, that was the only time I could ever see a breaching whale. I'd have to paint it myself. Okay, we finished our book. We planted a vegetable garden. Our dog has been groomed. Jack has been groomed. He's now ready for any class A dog show in the country. And so I had no deadlines. I had no sponsors, no people on my back, oh, excuse me, uh, 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 after stuff. So Mary said, Larry, you have finished everything. Let's, uh, let's relax. I said, yeah, I turned, I turned 87. Time to relax and uh, do some drawings and some fun stuff. And, and Mary patted me on the back of the head and said, Larry, have fun. It just so happens I had about six shoe boxes of felt pens in the studio. So we took those felt pens and turned them into a bunch of little sketchy, scrapey, scratchy dolphin vi videos. I sort of went full circle because at the beginning I, I criticized artists for making things up. Well, I made these up. They're not great works of art. They're just fun. Here's the first felt pen drawing. You have to watch your eyes. They're pretty scrapey and scratchy, mostly for friends and relatives. I don't think the Metropolitan Museum of Fine Art is going to call me up. Here's another one. And here's another one. Felt pens, you know, Safeway markers. Here's another one. Here's the last one. There's some nice dolphins felt pen. Having mastered the medium of felt pen, I went into transparent watercolor. Here's a nice transparent watercolor done off the top of my head. Uh, no research, just do it. When I say transparent watercolor, that tells you that if you're seeing white, uh, that's the color of the paper coming through. Opaque, like gouache or tempera watercolor, if you see white, that's opaque paint. So these are transparent watercolors. I want to call attention to the, the dolphin in the lower left. To me, that's pure Picasso. Here's another, yeah, here's another uh, transparent watercolor dolphin doodles. Just having fun with dolphins. Here's another one. This is a dolphin jamboree. I used a little pen on this one. Here's another one. A little dolphin. Uh, Meeting of the Minds with some nice dolphins. Yeah, hold on now, Mary. I just wanted to mention that about three months, people ask me all the time, what, the, what are you working on now? Well, about two or three months, I started a, a series called um, The Fluke Variations. That's right, The Fluke Variations. 
and they're just little watercolors of flukes. I love whale flukes. So I went ahead and started a series of paintings of whale flukes. Here's one. Uh, I didn't mean to make them transparent, it's just that I didn't know which one uh, would go in front. These are uh, whales, uh, whales in love. Here's another one, transparent watercolor of whale flukes, the fluke variations. Um, here's another one, just making it up as I go along, having fun. And here's the last one, the very last slide. I just finished this one this morning. Um, I say I finished it. I, I, I never really finish any of them. I just get tired of working on them. So that's our very last slide. And I'd like, oh, oh, hold on, there's one more slide. We, we mentioned our dog. I mentioned our little dog, Jack, uh, several times. Mary, could you show one photograph of Jack just for fun? There he is. Mary took that beautiful photograph and I glued it to a box of Wheaties. That's Jack Foster, Bowser of Champions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's uh, that's the last of our presentation. Thank you so much, ACS. We love you, people. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Uh, thank you, Brian. And if anyone can make up any questions, we would uh, we would try and sit here and answer them. Oh, huh, Mary. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Mary. That was amazing. Um, like. Like I said in the past, uh, if you have any questions at all, throw it into the chat function. Uh, what an amazing uh, presentation, Larry. I'm really intrigued and curious about a lot of your work. If there are any way that people can get access to them or buy them from you, um, especially some of your newer stuff. I think um, I'm seeing a lot of stuff into the uh, chat that some people are interested in uh, your watercolors and your transparent a fluke so oh well, how uh, nice those are they're just fun <laughs> but people like them people like them so that's i think uh that's gonna be my first question is is there any way uh, that people can have access to them yeah well we have whalesonlypress.com and that uh that starts at the beginning of my life and says everything that Mary and I have ever done, including folk dancing and <laughs> flying model airplanes. And, yeah, so uh, whales only, um, whalesonlypress.com is a bunch of information on how to contact me and Mary and our little doggy and, and uh, see some more artwork. Uh, that's the way to do it. That's okay. the easy way of doing it. We'd be happy to hear. Oh, I see it at the yeah. bottom of, of, the, of the screen, whalesonlypress.com. Yeah, yeah, and we'd be happy to hear from anybody. We love it. Love ACS, my yeah. favorite people on the planet. One of uh, the first questions uh, that Cat Morgan has uh, put into the chat is, have you ever done a whale mur uh, mural? Have you ever done a whale mural? Have you ever done a whale mural? You did for ACS. Did I ever do a whale mural? Well, that, not on us. No, I guess not. No. Too bad. But you did do I did those portraits, but no, not a whale mural. Can't find a building. <laughs> I bet you you can. I bet you can <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. Uh, John Delaney is asking, was your whales of the world poster watercolor? And what was the scale of the poster? Uh, what Which poster? Sorry. It says a uh, whales of the world poster. Oh, the National Geographic. What was your medium, Larry, for the National Geographic, the first one? Oil paint. Oil. And what Oil was paint the size? on an illustration board. And it was a 30 by 40. 30 by 40. Wow. Yeah, I took it on the airplane, and uh, everybody said, okay. Took it on the airplane and flew back to Washington, D.C. Showed it to them. They liked it. <laughs> uh, is that, uh, this is just a question for me, and some people on the in the chat, is that print for National Geographic, is that also available on your Whales Only Press? Uh, on your website no it's available in lots of places but i don't we've, think in our we've in our... seen it online you can order it at other yeah. on other websites but it's out of print yeah. um and we only have like two left <laughs> yeah one for her one for me yeah yeah you know uh, brian one thing that blue whale that blue whale flipper that i showed that that painting that drawing that pencil drawing is 10 feet long. It's almost a mural. One inch equals a foot, and the whale is 100 inches long. So it's a large, large. To get back to that mural. Yeah, yeah. Almost, almost a mural. It's a near mural. 
I have a lot of um, people from saying Mel, Bonnie said, thank you so much. Beautiful images. Uh, Diane says, uh, we love you, Larry and Mary. Wow, fantastic presentation. Um, uh, love what? the fluke watercolors. What? Uh, He's reading the questions. Oh, OK. So uh, uh, Jeannie, or sorry, Jan says, uh, fantastic. My kids used to climb on Sandy the Whale in Pacific Grove. Need to know the uh, uh, great, to, need to know the artist now. Um, Kyle says, thank you for the presentation. My kids and, and I enjoyed a lot. Um, oh. <laughs> hey, Kyle. Uh, um, Sophie White says, uh, wonderful to tune in from New Zealand. Thank you for the talk, Larry and Mary. Wow. I collected wow. your poster from National Geographic's in the rural uh, New Zealand, um, and it led to my scientific illustration work. Thank oh. you for the huge appreciation. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Um, Uko says, love your talk. You're an amazing inspiration to me. Uh, question, do any of your whale models still exist? Whale models. Uh, whale models. Does he mean sculptures? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. I think uh, whale sculptures, whale models, maybe the like the fin whale. You might talk about your model for the large sculptures. The only models I made were for the sculptures. And the, 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 the models were one inch equals a foot, like everything else I did. Um, we own you, you, make a, you make a model, one inch equals a foot. A, the gray whale had a 40 inch model. Uh, and that's how we constructed the whale from that model. But I never, I never had, I never made models to sell or anything like that. Yeah. No. But we do own, we do have the models for Sandy and Fina ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, anyone who wants to build another wheel we, could easily. We have the original models. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's good to know. I, I, so I, I'm curious, where are these models? Are they just hanging out in your garage or? Oh, no, yeah, one was right here. <laughs> <laughs> it was right over there. The boxes packaged up. One was right there. I can see it from here. May I show that? You can't show it. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, one's forty inches. They're not too big. One, uh, yeah. Sandy's the forty inch, and and Fina's fifty inches. Fifty inches, quite so. a large model. And what you do is you cut them up with a bandsaw, like a loaf of bread, and you take those sections out and you enlarge them, and you build your full size. You build your full size whale from those enlargements. That's how I did it. Mary says it could be done with a computer now, but I don't know yeah, how. Probably a 3D uh, computer. I don't know what kind of computer <laughs> that would be to make a 40-foot gray whale, but <laughs> could happen. Uh, and, Kate, oh, sorry. Uh, continue, continue. Oh, that's all. That's good. Uh, Kate's saying, thank you for your pioneering work from another scientific illustrator who got started on your work at the Smithsonian 30 years ago. Uh, Mary Lou says... Um, I helped build Fina and worked for Larry. The best, uh, where's Fina now, Larry? At the Lawrence Hall of Science. Mary Lou Therkoff, she's a hard worker. I know her well, she's a very good friend. And she did stand her little fingers to the bone on that whale over at Fort Mason. Fina the fin wheel. Fina is now permanently uh, installed at the Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley, a uh, part of uh, UC Berkeley. Anyone can go up and climb on it. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Um, Milos is saying, truly inspirational body work, Larry. Uh, Sharon says, love it. And you too. I think I need a fluke to add to my collection. A uh, <laughs> question that I have for you is, um, I, I know you were kind of saying that your main project right now, or like what you have been working on your um, your artwork with the felt pens and everything. Is there anything else that, people should know that you might be working on in general or is there anything else other than kind of your your small flukes anything else you're gonna no work on? no i have nothing planned well i have ideas about a large sculpture up here in fort bragg and and we'll be uh, talking about that uh, in december with some people noyo center yeah noyo center up here. Yeah, which quite a good. We have a lot of whale uh, people in uh, Fort Bragg, up here in the Littoral, California. 
Um, Jack Sims says, uh, Larry, we did do a limited edition of Grey Whales in cast polyester resin and yeah. uh, calcium carbonate. Don't know yeah. where they are all now. Jack Sims, where are they now? <laughs> because Jack Sims organized that whole thing and he made a bunch of them. He may have one. And I don't think he ended up with one and I didn't end up with one, but he made about 30 or 40 of them. Uh, they were 40 feet, 40 inches long, made of fiberglass, and Jack Sims did the whole thing. Jack Sims is an outstanding whale person. We're still good friends, of course. What do you mean still? Well, we're still good friends. <laughs> um, so I think uh, we're going to kind of wrap it up. Uh, if anyone else has any uh, questions, feel free to throw it in. I'll, I'll look over it really quickly. Um, but when the last things that I like to do for American Cetacean Society is asking uh, you, uh, Larry and Mary, is if you have any advice for anyone young or who wants to get into your field, uh, so like science illustration or even, you know, doing whale sculptures, what is the main advice that you would give them right now? Wayne Tebow. I would, I would concentrate fidelity because I never liked Toonie Town whales and I grew up with them. I uh, I would I say external external morphology is the way to go and it's the most fascinating and most interesting like the narwhal's tusk. What's what's why is that a good idea? Anyway uh, the the field of cetology is full of um, full of wonderful anomalies and things to look at and study. Amazing animals. Amazing. We love our fluke friends. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here at American Cetacean Society. Um, if you have any questions or you want to uh, reach out to him, uh, can we reach out to you at whalesonlypress.com? Is that the right. best or what is the best for us to do that? Yes. Yeah, we're sitting right here. Yeah. Okay. Whales Only Press. This Whales is Only Press. You can contact Larry through that. Com. Awesome. So uh, definitely, if you have any questions and you want to reach out to Larry and Mary, uh, definitely go on to their website, whalesonlypress.com. I'm going to be doing that, uh, of course, to look through all the different uh, different artworks. And I hope, Larry and Mary, to see uh, some of your new flukes soon. So uh, thank you, everyone. And I hope you all have a good night. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Stop sharing and leave. Thank you all. <laughs>